Well, you know, it's a good a time together in church when there's people still singing when someone's doing the announcements because it's like, man, God, God is moving during our time of worship and it's powerful. And man, I never want to take that for granted. Do you? I, I just never want to take it for granted when it just seems like, wow, God, you're, you're moving in our hearts and, and, uh, and to thank him for it and to thank him for every good and perfect gift that comes from him, uh, including pumpkins and spiders and spider webs and dark clouds. I'm just saying, like, lest anybody else start trying to claim those things and, and call them evil, I say, no, thank you. We'll take back the pumpkins and we'll have the spiders and the spider webs. And God made those and they're good. And, and by the way, evenings, evenings, hallowed evenings. I'll, I'll take that back too while I'm at it, if you don't mind. And, and I want to say this, right? Just because of what's going on this week and, and some of us might feel a little upset if somebody says happy Halloween. Guess what? Hallowed is a word that in Old English just means holy, and e'en is for evening, as in the evening before a holy day. And last I read, the, the Bible says this is the day that the Lord has made, and, and I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. And so if somebody says happy Halloween to me, I'm just like, thank you. Thanks for reminding me about how holy this evening is, because tomorrow is another day that God has made. Like, I, so I have no trouble with it. I just want to reclaim some stuff today. I just want to take some stuff back and say, thank you. Give me my pumpkins. Give me my spiders. <laughs> Okay, so this is reverse polarity, part three, and uh, what, what we're doing is just focusing in on one verse from Micah, this prophet from 700 BC, and we're just saying, all right, that, that's still a call from God's heart for us, and in Micah 6, 8, it's just one verse, and I'm hoping that many of us are starting to memorize it, but this is what it says in Micah 6, 8. It says, uh, he has shown you, O man... What is good and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. But to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. I'm going to ask you to read the whole verse from the beginning out loud together, nice and strong, ready, go. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is it. Do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly. Do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly. Come on, say it. Do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly. This, there's something beautiful about this very precise call from Micah that it speaks to me about something that God is actually still requiring. And it does use that word require. It's God saying, I, I actually want that from you. And I hope maybe uh, that for some of us, this will get into our hearts a little bit. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. And today, I want to just zero in on that third phrase, walk humbly for a moment. Walk humbly. So uh, I have a brother-in-law who's a Navy SEAL, highly decorated, retired Navy SEAL, so I can talk about him now. But uh, he, he, he's you know, very well known in the Navy and all that. And so for all of my married life, I've you know, been interested in what he does and Navy stuff and SEAL team stuff. And so uh, he was uh, in the SEALs at the same time as a buddy of his, Jocko Willink and Leif uh, Babin and these guys. And, and those guys wrote a book called The Dichotomy of Leadership. And they basically took some ideas that they learned while being Navy SEALs and then applied it to leadership in life. And uh, I'm, I'm interested in all this, half, everything having to do with the SEAL team. So I read this and, and uh, the, he, he writes in one chapter of this book, about this time when they were over in Iraq as a SEAL team, big old platoon of SEAL team guys, and they had to go out and do their missions. And it, it, it's tough work what they have to do in the, in the night and in the secret. And after several days of being out on their mission, this uh, platoon of SEALs come back to the outpost. And the outpost was being kept up by a team of army guys. So army, navy, kind of working together. But the army guys, they're, you know, they're, they're there, and they, the SEAL team comes back after days out on mission in the field, and they are exhausted, they are hungry, they are tired, they are dirty, they need some rest. And they come into the, the outpost, and there's this big, huge 18-wheeler there, and it's full of sandbags. And the army guys are taking the sandbags, these huge sandbags, bags, and they're carrying them on their shoulders up three flights of stairs onto the roof because they need to uh, reinforce a position on the corner of the roof because stuff was going down. And so they get there, and th uh, 
Babin was the, was the uh, guy in charge of this part of the, uh, of the moment, and he, he sees the guys carrying the sandbags, and something inside of him is feeling like, I don't think we can just walk right on by them. <laughs> but the thing is, they're the SEAL teams. I mean, they're the elite fighting force, and they've been out on mission, and nobody expects anything from them except just go on in, guys, get some rest. But he suggests to the commander of the army uh, unit, hey, let us help out with those sandbags. And the army guy says, no, thank you, sir. We got this. You tell your boys to get in there and get some rest. And uh, this guy, Babin, he looks over at his uh, platoon leader or commander, whatever it is, and they look at each other and they give each other this knowing nod. And then the guy turns, Babin turns to the army commander and says, negative, sir, we're on sandbag duty. And they take the next 45 minutes and this whole platoon of uh, Navy SEAL starts carrying all those sandbags up to the rooftop until the job was complete and done. And then they went on in and got their rest. But I love this little story because of, of what it reflects. It, it reflects a group of guys who are strong, capable, able, and have a high position, but nevertheless, they stepped into doing something that they didn't have to do for the sake of others that needed some encouragement. And, and to me, it's a great picture of humility. And in fact, the chapter that that little story uh, comes from in that book, it, it, the chapter is simply, uh, be humble, not passive. And I think maybe for some of us, the idea of being humble or, or humility sometimes gets associated with uh, being passive or being weak or being uh, inept or unable or <laughs> aloof or something like that. And, and I, I love this little uh, story about that SEAL team because it's the exact opposite. I mean, all of us understand that these are guys who are totally capable and able and, and nevertheless did something. And, and really what they did is they shifted uh, their focus from themselves to others. And that is really what I'm asking us to consider doing too to make the shift, to shift our focus from self to others and God and love. That's the main idea of my message today. Shift the focus from self to others and God in love. I want you to just say it one time with me. Ready? Go. Shift the focus from self to others and God in love. Yeah, that, that's, I believe, what is on on my heart from the Lord for us today in his word, we're going to take some time to turn to the scriptures in Philippians chapter 2. So open your Bible to Philippians chapter 2. And as you're making your way to Philippians chapter 2, the letter to the Philippians is inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by Paul. And the group of Christians in Philippi, they seem to be a group of people that has a really good sense of the gospel about how good it is to just be right with God because of Jesus. And, and this group of people in Philippi has a, a good experience of being the community of God's people together. And, and so they're living in the gospel. They have the hope of heaven. They've got a good community of other believers they're with. And so Philippians chapter 2 begins by basically saying something to the effect of, all right, if, if you... If you're good, if you feel good about the fact that you're right with God through Jesus, if that comforts you on the inside at all, then show it on the outside and, and do it like this. And that's where we jump in Philippians chapter two. It says, don't be selfish. Philippians two, three, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And therefore, God elevated him to a place of highest honor, gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I am grateful for the humility of Jesus. 
I'm so grateful that Jesus humbled himself, aren't you? I'm grateful for the beauty of the humility of Jesus, that, that he would be willing, he would be willing to let go of what he had every right to hold on to, heaven itself, that he was willing to say, I'm not clinging to that. Why? Because I'm coming for you. I, I could stay where it's glorious and comfortable, but I'm coming here for you. I'm entering into time and space because you need me to. I'm so grateful for the humility of Jesus that he humbled himself and stepped into time and space so that he could take the burden of my shame and my guilt and my sin and take it to the cross where he was impaled to pay the price for it. I'm so grateful that Jesus humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross we read so that I could receive the gift of God's grace and his mercy washing me clean every single day. I'm grateful for the humility humility of Jesus, that he humbled himself and gave up heaven so that I could get heaven. I'm grateful for the humility of Jesus. I guess it's just a few of us. But I want to take a minute and say, thank you, Jesus, for humbling yourself. Thank you, Jesus, for humbling yourself. Say it with me. Thank you, Jesus, for humbling yourself. Thank you, Jesus, for humbling yourself and coming into this time and space, into this dirt, and into this area, into this place, into my life, and taking up the sin that I brought to the table and bringing your grace to the table instead. Thank you, Jesus, for humbling yourself and becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, so that I could really live. Thank you, Jesus, for humbling yourself so that I could be forgiven by the life you laid down. Thank you, Jesus, for humbling yourself and showing me how to live a life marked by the power of heaven by laying it down. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for humbling yourself. Just just say it loud. Thank you, Jesus, for humbling yourself. And, And I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. And so What that means is I look at the way Jesus lived and what he did, and I say, okay, how how do I do that too in my own way? And there is a calling from God on every single one of us to humble ourselves. Do you think that matters this next couple of weeks? I do. I think it's an important time to say, God, thank you for speaking to me, because I was about to feel a certain kind of way, and he's saying, and walk humbly. Humble yourself. So I want us to think together about this part of the Bible and take it in deeply. Again, verse 3, one more time. It said in Philippians 2, 3, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Verse 3, one more time. I want you to read verse 3 out loud with me. Ready? Go. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Everybody say others. others. Come on, say it again. Others. others. Oh. Others. 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 One more time. Just say it. Others. And do you hear it? Do you hear what the Spirit of God might be saying to you? It really matters that we walk humbly. And that we take to heart this word and to to be humble. What is it? Humility. I mean, I'll throw down some thoughts about humility for a second. Humility is having an accurate awareness of your own weaknesses and your own strengths and your real capacity and an understanding of how totally dependent on God you actually really are every minute of every day. And it's about having a keen sense of value for other people people, no matter what kind of others they might be, and a willingness to throw your pride aside and just do what you can to serve. Okay, that's a lot of words. A brilliant guy, though, summed it up really quickly, and this is C.S. Lewis, and he said, humility, it's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. So, So this is what I think God's calling us to. And it's a high calling. It's a high standard. 
And the difficulty is we live in a world right now where it's getting increasingly hard to do that because the world we live right now is one in which it's all about self. It's all about my self-image. It's about my uh, self-aggrandizement. It's about my self-identity. It's about uh, my self-care. It's about my self-promotion. It's about my self-image management. It's about my social projection of who I am. Do you know what I mean? And so we, we live in this world where the mold is getting tighter and tighter, forcing a, a focus on self. But I'm telling you today, there's a calling from God to us to shift the focus from self to others and God in love. That's my message today. One more time. Shift the focus from self to others and God in love. Say it with me. Shift the focus from self to others and God in love. That is where God's taking each of us to this kind of a place, to be humble in this kind of a way. And there's value in the humility that you can bring. Real value. Let me paint the picture like this. So that story of that that Navy SEAL platoon carrying those sandbags, they didn't have to do that. That was somebody else's thing, but they, they did not have to do that. But that SEAL team commander is looking over at this Army platoon leader and he's thinking, wait a minute, these, these are the people that, uh, that provide security for our outposts so that we have a safe place to go back to. Wait a minute, these are the people who, who are ready to be the quick reaction force if things go sideways out on our mission. Like, wait a minute, these are the people that are providing all the ground support so that we can do our thing and, and, and so that it can be successful. I can't walk by these guys. And so they did it. They, carried, they said, we're, we're negative, sir. We're on sandbag duty or whatever it was. And they carried those sandbags when they didn't have to. And here's the value of that moment. You know what that did? That humility did something. It created a a sense of connection with people who otherwise would have been not very well connected. It created a sense of goodwill between people who were uh, in different places. It it created a, a wave of encouragement that flowed probably this way and then back the other way too. It created a, a, a sense of respect being communicated even though there was a, probably a different status in these guys. All of that is beautiful and good. And guess what? Every time you, you, you walk humbly, you create those kinds of waves too. And it's part of why we're, why we're here is to create the goodwill that comes when we actually live out the call from the scriptures to walk humbly, to humble ourselves. And, and so I, I want you to take a, a couple of examples. One would, be, one would be one of the richest guys in the world. I'm talking about Jeff Bezos. So three decades ago, Amazon was nothing but an idea in a a balding guy's brain, right? And, uh, and, and fast forward a couple of decades, and probably every single one of us have this week gotten a package on our doorstep that we you know, ordered 12 hours before, right? And it's, it's amazing. But it began as an idea. And back in the day, when Jeff Bezos was just getting started, he got investors together and did a rally, and he wrote him a letter. And at the end of his letter, he signed it off by saying, this is day one. And 30 years ago, that made a lot of sense. This is day one. I mean, he had all this stuff that he was imagining that maybe they could do in the future. <laughs> Fast forward just a few decades, and it's one of the most valuable entities on planet Earth, a $2 trillion company. It, but, but here's what's fascinating is every year, Jeff Bezos still writes this, uh, this letter to his shareholders, and every single year, he still signs off the letter, this is day one. As in... There's still more that we need to do. We have not arrived yet. We have a long way to go. Nobody received any packages on the moon yet. So, I mean, right? It's, it's this mentality of humility, of recognizing I haven't arrived. I, I got to keep going. There's still more for me to move towards. And, and that mindset actually creates value, right? Even in an economic sense, it creates value. But, but you and I who reflect the kingdom of God, we get to reflect a value that is spiritual by dignifying others. Now, here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that that God has some promises in his word about humility, that today would be a good day to take to heart. So, for example, James 4, 6, there's a promise. God gives grace, it says. He gives grace generously. As the scripture says, 
God opposes the proud, but, say it with me, he gives grace to the humble. Anybody need some grace from God? I mean, some grace, some, some covering, some, some gift when I didn't deserve it, grace. Right, and God's promise is, yeah, hum as you humble yourself, as you walk in humility, that opens the door to a flood wave of grace coming your way. So if you need some more of God's grace, then humble yourself. Find the way to do it. And another promise from God's word is 1 Peter 5, 6. Read it out loud with me. Ready, go. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Anybody here hoping, man, I just hope God would lift me up sometime in my life. Anybody here hope that God would lift you up in your life sometime? Anybody honest enough to say, of course. And God's word says, right. So humble yourself under God's mighty hand. And his part, his promise is the lifting up in due time. And then Jesus spoke these words in Matthew 23, verse 12. He said, those who exalt themselves, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's like Jesus is saying, there is this reverse polarity equation that you have the opportunity to step into by choice. And I would rather humble myself than be humbled. How about you? And so there's something, though, as we're, we're discovering about humility in the Bible, there's something about humility that invites and that attracts God's goodness. Did you catch all of that in each of those promises? There's something about humility that invites God's goodness that God is attracted to. And I think maybe the reason why is because humility at its core in its essence, is about value for others. And God, his heart's revealed in the, the gospel that we all know. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So God has already shown his cards that his heart is about people and the value he has for people. And so when you and I start walking in humility, true humility, we're starting to walk in a, a reflection of value for other people. And God's looking and going, now I like that. Don't you see it? Why did it get so quiet? This is good. This is a revelation for somebody. When you humble yourself, you think, oh, I'm going low and I'm going to be low now. No, you are inviting and attracting the goodness of God because when you operate in true humility and you're placing value on other people, your heavenly father looks at that and says, I'm down with that. Let me see how I can partner with you. Because look at how you're placing value on other people. So, so the message today, again, is just simply this. Shift the focus from self to others and God in love. <laughs> this is the Jesus way. This is the kingdom of God way. This is the people of God way. When we're following Jesus, <laughs> we, we get to live it out like this. We get to shift the focus from self to God and others in love. When we hear the word humble or humility, sometimes we think of it as an inner disposition. We think of humility as something we feel inside. But when you read the Bible, what you find is that humility from the Old Testament through to the New, it's never just an inner disposition. It is an inner disposition that begins that way, but it must move into an outward engagement that places value on people other than yourself. That, that is what humility must do. Real humility doesn't stay inside as a spiritual feeling. It comes through a life lived in, in pursuit of showing God's goodness to others. And it requires you and I sometimes to shift the focus. Some days we wake up and our focus is on the stuff going on in our lives and how hard it is, how tough it is, and it's real. But we have an opportunity even then to shift the focus to others and God. And then watch how God engages with us in our lives. The word in the Bible that's, that's translated humble, in, in the Hebrew especially, coming from the Old Testament, it is often used as a noun or an adjective, but to describe people who don't have resources, who don't have a high position, who aren't important. 
and, and, and we, we understand that from the word the humble, right? But, but can we think about what that really means and who, who people that are called the humble might be? I remember a time in my life where, uh, this is a couple decades ago now, I'm, 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 I'm dinosaur status at this point, but uh, it, it was uh, yeah, in 1999, something like that, and I'm, I'm the worship pastor at this church in uh, Pasadena called Calvary Baptist Church. And this was a once upon a time, big old, grand old church, but by this time, uh, a lot of people had left uh, the city of Pasadena, so there's only a handful, 20, 30 people in our little church there. And I was the worship guy. I'm supposed to get musicians and create a worship team or something. There's nobody, nobody. There's one lady who played the bells. I'm like, ah, uh, I'm looking for something else. I'm not kidding. They had the best bell collection in Pasadena. Um, and, and she knew what to do with every one of them. But I needed some musicians. So I found, uh, I found this, this, one, this one kid on this, that he was literally just playing guitar, busking on the street and said, would you come play guitar at our church? I just, you know, I needed somebody. And then there was this guy who was attending the church a lot, uh, and, and he, he was really hard to talk with because he never seemed to be quite in his right mind, to be honest. His name is Danny, and, and Danny played the cajon, and he, and he played it really well. He played the cajon and all the per percussion instruments, and so I invited Danny to play on our team. And then one day I was like, hey, Danny, uh, I'll, I'll, walk, I'll walk home with you. And he said, OK, OK. And I walked home with him. We got to this, this industrial type of a place. And, and we, we, there was this wooden box over in the corner of this industrial lot. And, and I was like, well, wh what are we doing here? Where do you live? And he's like, he pointed to the box. And so it wasn't that he just played cajon. He also lived in one. Not even kidding. It was this wooden box. And it had a little padlock on it. And he opened it up, and he, he showed me his stuff in there and his whatever earthly belongings and his sleeping bag. And, and, and he was, you know, kind of not quite all, all, all there, but he was there enough to tell me why he lived here. And he was describing just the trauma that he didn't use that word, but the hard things that he'd been through and why he was just too afraid to go and live in, in, a, in a building with other people. And this is where he was comfortable. And he was talking about how... How, you know, he loved it, actually. And as long as the weather was good, it was fine. It was, just was a problem when it started to rain. And it was kind of mind-blowing to me. You know, I didn't grow up like that. So I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, really? You're, you're okay with this? And he didn't want anything else. But this is, this is who he was. And he, he did have talent. And he did have strength. And he had ability. And he came and he served at our church. And he was the humble. And then there was this guy on our team that I, I, he was at our church all the time. And I said, well, would you just like run the soundboard? And his name was Vince. And Vince ran sound. And after practice one day, I was walking out. Uh, and I said, hey, do you, where do you live, man? And he pointed at his van. He said, right there, baby. And he pointed to this van. And he lived in his van. And it wasn't like a, a, a Mercedes Sprinter all decked out. It was like a 25-year-old rusting out creeper status cargo van and and he, he opened it up and he showed me like where he, where his stuff was and and he was just describing to me he's like yeah yeah I mean my, my biggest challenge is trying to find where I can park without you know getting woken up in the middle of the night by somebody or or how am I going to find a you know a shower every couple of days and and I'm just listening I'm I, my mind is kind of blown like wow it's just a different way of living but this man he had talent he had skill. He had something that he could contribute. He was the humble, but he also had a focus on others. He came and served at our church week in and week out. And I, le I look back to that year of, of my life, and I'm so grateful that I got to know these guys, that you, you could say those were the humble. But what, what God gave me through that is, I mean, I went and hung out at this guy's box with him from time to time. I stood by this dude's van where he lived from time to time. And, and in those brief moments, God gave me the, the blessing of being able to, if I could say it this way, walk humbly. Not because I had anything to bring to this moment, except these guys invited me into their lives for a moment. And they were the humble. It changed me. It messed with me. It caused me to, to rethink, like, who is who? And the value of individuals, no matter where they're coming from, no matter what they happen to have gone through and where they are right now. 
that they have something inside, a child of God with dignity, with worth, and with value that needs to be perceived. And here's what I'm thinking about Jesus. Jesus, it says, did not regard his equality with God as something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. Why did he do it? Because of his perception. He perceived through all time and space you. And even though you've been living in the box of sin, and even though you've been tooling around in the van of shame and guilt, he said, I, but I see you. But I see you, and I see who you are. I see the value that you carry and the worth that's inherent in your very being. And I'm coming to bring all of that value out to redeem you so that you can call out one day, Jesus is Lord. I'm so grateful that he humbled himself and that he did it because of his perception of value in you and me. Somebody might just well say, thank you, Jesus, right now. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing the goodness that you saw. And I, I think this, uh, this mindset matters in this next couple weeks. Here we are a week away from the election, week and a half, and, and I'm standing here while we're about to complete this election cycle, and I'm telling you, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly, and, and walk humbly. Walking humbly is about having an awareness of your weaknesses and your strengths, you and I, we have a certain strength in a moment like this, where there's an election. We get to vote. I do think that walking humbly includes using that opportunity to express something. And so I will say, if you would walk humbly in this next couple of weeks, do so while you vote, and do so with others in mind. In particular, I would say this, vote with unborn babies in mind. Vote with businesses that need lower taxes in mind. Vote with safety for our nation in mind. Vote with a decrease of world war threat in mind. I mean, these, these things really matter. And it is, I do believe, part of what it means to walk humbly. You shift the focus from self to others and God in love. I just want to wrap up with this one, uh, this one anecdote. Right? Abraham Lincoln is probably a, a favorite president to a lot of us. And, you know, he, the way Abraham Lincoln is known is he's known as a guy who was humble. But it's one thing to just say the word humble about him. It's another thing to understand why people really felt that way. One of the reasons is how he handled opposition. So Abraham Lincoln is, is the president, and in a time that was dicey for the history of our nation, and there were a bunch of people out there uh, you know, trying to make the case for, hey, we should you know, keep slavery, right? That was actually in people's minds. And Abraham Lincoln is trying to figure out, what do I do? And there's this guy named Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass was a slave who had been freed. And he became a powerful voice in the abolition movement. And Frederick Douglass was out there on every street corner talking about what needed to happen. Frederick Douglass was talking about, this is, this is what history needs to say, that we fought for freedom. But in that, he also had to come against the president. So Frederick Douglass was a fierce opponent of President Abraham Lincoln. He was shouting him down in the public squares. Articles were being written in the papers about what Frederick Douglass was saying about Lincoln. Now, Lincoln, he's the president. But you know what he did? He invited Frederick Douglass to come to the White House. He just said, come. Let's just sit together. Let's talk with each other. At that particular point in history, they had completely opposing views, or at least so it seemed, on the surface. But they got together, they sat with each other, Frederick Douglass gave Abraham Lincoln a piece of his mind, and Abraham Lincoln listened. I think why people think about Abraham Lincoln as humble has everything to do with that. To say, let me, let me hear where you're coming from. And he listened. He listened to Frederick Douglass talk about why in the world are you okay with sending freed people back to their, their slave owner. This is ridiculous. And it convinced Abraham Lincoln. 
It, it changed his mindset. The humility to enter into a conversation, to just listen a little bit, changed history. It turned into a moment where not just once, but time and time again, Frederick Douglass became a friend of Abraham Lincoln, even though they didn't see quite eye to eye. But it did make a difference in where Abraham Lincoln ended up going. And, and you, you and I know where history finally came with an Emancipation Proclamation. But it began with just a guy and another guy having the humility enough to say, I can talk with you. I can share my opinion with you. I can listen to you. And look what God can do through some humility. And so I'm just praying that maybe for some of us, we might step into that. Even in this next uh, week and a half or so, the walk humbly. Walk humbly. Turn towards somebody next to you and tell them, walk humbly. Yeah. But let me just, let me just take you back to Jesus in wrapping this up. If, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, talking about Jesus humbling himself, it says this, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave, and he was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God had elevated him to the place of highest honor, gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We get the privilege here and now of declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord. So I know there's a lot of us here that would say, yes, that's the truth. Jesus Christ is Lord. You, you have already come to understand that you need the mercy of God and that Jesus Christ is the one who purchased it for you. And that you easily say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Somebody who's a believer right now and you know he's the Lord of my life, would you just say, Jesus Christ is Lord? Yeah. And there are some of us in this moment, the truth is, he is not the Lord of your life. For some of you, it's because you're a believer, but you stopped listening to him. Your heart has gotten hard. Yeah, you, you, you put your trust in Jesus once upon a time, but you're not living like it. You're just doing whatever you want to do. You're ignoring his voice. You're not going the way that he's showing you. And so functionally, he's not Lord in your life right now. And that's a problem. And right now, today, <laughs> through this message, it's like he's saying to you, your heart's getting hard. You're going to get into a place that's not going to be so good if you keep going. But I love you. I want to be Lord. I want to be Lord of your life. And today, for somebody, it's time. You got to come. You got to come back. You're listening to this right now because you know God is trying to get a hold of you, and you're about to slip way back down. And God's saying, "But I got you. Come back. Let me be Lord of your life." So somebody, if this is for you. Today's the day to say, Jesus Christ, I'm coming back to you, and I declare that you are Lord, Lord of my life. And, and for somebody, you're already a believer, but that's what you need to do right now. Someone else, truth is, here you are in church, and you're hearing all of this, and you're hearing about how God has bridged the gap so you could be forgiven and get his grace, and you want it, and you're wondering how. Well, you invite Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. You ask him to forgive your sin and save you. And if you've never done that, man, today's the day to do it. Ask him to forgive your sin and save your life. So just take a moment, would you? And for, for this moment, uh, just where you are, close your eyes for a second and pray with me. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the Bible. I thank you for giving us insight through your word of what you require. He has shown you, oh man, what is good? What does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. 
Lord, I pray that today you would infuse each one of us with a fresh flow from heaven for walking humbly with our God. Oh, please, please, God, save us from our vanity, our arrogance, our pride. Help us, Lord, to shift our focus from ourself to others, to you in love. Help me, God, to shift my focus. You can say that with me. Help me, God, to shift my focus. Help me, God, to shift my focus from self to others and you in love. Lord, I pray in particular that we who bear your name would walk in a way that is worthy of your name, even over this next week and a half, God, that uh, where there's a bunch of polarity, that we would bring some, some peace in Jesus, some humility in Jesus. Help us, Lord. I pray, God, for a spiritual awakening for somebody right now, too. You're here today, and the truth is, you don't know where you stand with God. You wish you could be right with God. And I'm telling you, the way to be right with God is through faith in Jesus. To ask Jesus to forgive your sin and be Lord of your life. If you've never asked Jesus to forgive your sin and be Lord of your life, now is the time to do that so that you will be saved for all eternity. If you're sitting here and you're thinking, I want to, I want to ask Jesus to forgive me and save me. Right now, I want you to raise your hand with me. Right now, just raise it and raise it high and don't hold back and keep it up for a moment. Yeah, just keep it up for a moment. Here in my, in my front, in my left, in the front, if there's anyone else here on my right, I see you, sir. That's good. Anyone else, I want to make sure I don't miss you in the back on my right. Thank you. Anyone else, just make it known. Like, this is it. I, I once and for all, I'm asking for the forgiving mercy of Jesus, that I could be saved, that I could be forgiven, that I could receive the hope of heaven. And raise your hand with me. And if you're joining online, just type it in and say, I want to say yes to Jesus. And now pray with me and say something like this. Those of you with your hand raised, say, Jesus Christ, I believe in you. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. And just tell him, Jesus, I repent of all my sin. And Jesus, would you forgive me? And would you save me? Jesus Christ, I believe you paid the price for my sin when you died on the cross. And Jesus, I believe you're alive. You beat death. And so Jesus, would you come into my life and be Lord? Jesus, you are Lord of my life. I'm yours from this day forth. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I want you all to stand up. And before we walk out of this place, I want us to declare Jesus is Lord. And to say out loud, I declare Jesus Christ is Lord. Say it with me. I declare Jesus Christ is Lord. One more time, say it. I declare Jesus Christ is Lord. Say it loud. I declare Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus, you are Lord of my mind, body, soul, and spirit. Jesus, you're Lord of my hands and whatever I put them to. Jesus, you are Lord of my feet and wherever I go. Jesus, you are Lord of my face and how I use it to communicate with people. Jesus, you are Lord of my eyes and what I'm looking at and how I'm looking at people. Jesus, you are Lord of my family. You're Lord of my house. Come on, say it with me. It's not just me. Jesus, you are Lord of my marriage. Jesus, you are Lord of my friendships. Jesus, you are Lord of my business. Lord of my businesses. Jesus, you are Lord of my future. Jesus, you are Lord of my city. You are Lord of Murrieta. You're Lord of Lake Elsinore. You're Lord of Menifee. You're Lord of Wildemar. You're Lord of Temecula. You're Lord of Fallbrook. You're Lord of Moreno Valley. Jesus, you are Lord of California. Jesus Christ, you are Lord over the United States of America. Shout it. Jesus Christ is Lord. Come on, sing it out. Hey, thanks for watching this week's message. I pray it has encouraged you and blessed you. And if you would like to connect with us here at Centerpoint, visit us on mycenterpoint.tv. And if you would like to partner with us financially, click that Give button. Also, uh, don't forget to hit subscribe if you want more videos like this. I pray you have a blessed day.